Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, there's been a lot of talk today in the House on this bill with regard to helping middle class. And um, I want to talk about uh, middle class and the overall economy in my riding and specifically in Alberta. Um, it's grim right now. I want everyone in this House to understand what it is like in Alberta right now. You cannot walk down a street, you can't go anywhere without talking to somebody who has been directly impacted by, I think, what is a significant economic issue in this country. And I, I want you all in this House to realize what's going on right now. It's a really, really serious thing. I get so many calls in my office from people who just don't know what to do. You know, this, is, this isn't just oil sector workers, this is the service industry, this is everything. You all have to realize here that people's severances are running out in the next few months. This is a major issue. And so when we're sitting here talking academically about the middle class and about what's happening, this is where the rubber hits the road. And I implore all of you, when we're thinking about this type of policy, this type of economic policy, to understand what it means to somebody who does not have a job and does not have any sort of prospect of a job. I've, I've heard in this place, um, you know, what's happening in Alberta is simply explained away as, oh, it's just low commodity prices, or it's a lack of trust in this, or it's a lack of trust in that. The bottom line is that the energy sector, Canada's energy sector, whether you subscribe to it in your political philosophy or not, provides jobs to hundreds of thousands of people in this country. And it's particularly emotive for me because it is my riding. My riding's in the heart of this. And, uh, you know, there was an article in the Globe and Mail this week talking specifically how about this and how this downturn affects um, blue collar and, and lower income workers in Alberta more than anything. And so what blows my mind is that we're standing here talking about, you know, these policies in a way that they materially impact hundreds of thousands of people in this country and we're not talking about exactly what it means. And this is where I really hope that the government, you know, we might not, we're probably not going to agree on a lot of things, but I, I really hope that in their cabinet meetings, in their caucus meetings, they talk about the impact of what some of these means, what some of these things mean to people who are without a job in Calgary. When the finance minister comes out and talks about uh, raising taxes on stock options, uh, there was a January 10th Globe and Mail article that said small oil and gas firms also say that the government, they also want the government to reconsider its pledge to cap the amount employees can claim through their stock option income deductions. They say the change, if implemented, will be another blow to an industry already downtrodden by depressed crude oil and natural gas prices. You know, to stand up here, you know, my colleague from Kelowna Lake Country said, well, people don't take advantage of the tax-free savings accounts. 60% of Canadians who maxed out their TFSAs in 2013 had less than $60,000 in income. And we're taking, we're taking that increase away from them at a time when we should be, you know, promoting their investment in this. During the campaign, the Liberals said that they wanted to increase uh, the CPP contributions. So if you're out of a job, you don't have a prospect of a job, or you're a small business income owner, the economy is having a major significant issue, and then you're hearing a signal from the federal government, well, wait, we're going to increase those premiums. What do you think happens? What do you think happens? Less people get hired. That's more money off of people's paychecks. The same thing goes for EI premiums. You know. We can discuss in here, you know, I, I hear the rhetoric over and over again around income splitting. It only affects the wealthy. Well, I ask you what your definition is on wealthy. I ask you that. How do you define wealthy? Look into your writings and tell me that the people who benefit from income splitting are wealthy. I think you're going to have a hard time doing that. The same thing goes for the UCCB. When we cancel what our government put, when the Liberals cancel what our government put in place, uh, it will cost uh, $1,920 per child under six and $720 uh, for, for another amount. Um, students that are, have, and, and, and parents who have been paying for students in certain situations, uh, the textbook tax credit, um, 
that is a huge amount to somebody who is depending on that, a low-income earner student on an annual basis. They're signaling again that perhaps we shouldn't be, that students should be thinking about, you know, the fact that their taxes are going to go up because they're going to school. They, the, the other thing is with about Canada, with about the energy sector, if this was a manufacturing plant in Ontario, there would be national outcry about this. There would be all sorts of investment programs. There would be, you know, raw, raw, let's help this sector. And it just goes without notice. In fact, there's even more punitive things that they're, th they're talking about eliminating the mineral exploration tax credit, which is further going to depress the industry in Alberta. Um, the, uh, the other thing that, blows my mind at this point in time is in a time where we need to be telling workers in the energy sector that we want to promote growth in the sector, we are telling them that we are going to make the regulatory environment more uncertain. And you'll hear the rhetoric on the other side uh, that, oh, well, there's a lack of trust. Well, you know what? They've never quantified that. Our government put in place a responsible resource development package which invested in um, Things like we, we've got the Pipeline Safety Act, which had another billion dollars to respond to uh, to incidents, uh, on the polluter prey principle. The main thing that that bill did was put certainty on how long a process was going to take. It wasn't about getting to a yes. It was about getting to a yes or a no in a certain period of time because that is actually a determinant in investment in natural re the natural resource sector. Um, I come out of, uh, my background is in intellectual property management and in research administration. Um, to, to talk about you know, economic diversification and, and, and sort of dismiss the problems that are happening in Canada's energy sector is simply to do with commodity prices is so, or that somehow you can, the government can diversify the economy itself is so short-sighted. When you have a thriving industry, you use the receptor capacity that's created in that industry to see technologies be adopted, tested, um, you know, venture capital pools be created, all of those sorts of intellectual capital to stay in the country. And what you do when you tax, when you increase taxes on small businesses, when you raise, um, you know, taxes on stock options, those sort of incentives that help people to invest and innovate, it says, why would we bother, it says to people, why would we bother investing here? And it's just a very short-sighted philosophy to think that somehow by increasing taxes over and over again and by increasing the deficit of our country that this is going to miraculously result in, a, in an economic turnaround. And I want people to understand at home, anybody who's listening to Alberta in Alberta today, if you hear the Liberals over and over and over and over and over again say, well, it's just low commodity prices or it's just this, or it's just that. It shows a complete lack of understanding on how the sector works. Everyone in Alberta knows that you need to have regulatory certainty in order to move forward on major projects. We also need to have uh, ensure that we retain skilled labour, so when the prices do rebound, or we see that change, that all the skilled labour hasn't left. You haven't heard once from the government during this how they're going to keep the remarkable set of talent that we've built in Canada's energy infrastructure, how they're going to help them through this. All we hear is we're going to increase your taxes because you're wealthy. You know, the thing that that I think bothers me the most about this is that there is a lack of a plan. I mean, we heard in the campaign that they were going to have a $10 billion deficit. There's different, you know, schools of thought on whether or not that's a good or a bad thing. But I think what is very negative, Mr. Speaker, is the fact that the government here now, they don't even know what that end number is going to be. It's going to be $50 billion, $100 billion, who knows? We don't know what that's going to do for the Canadian economy. And for anybody who is in my riding, who is listening to this, anybody across the country who has a concern about where Canada's economy is going, write to your Liberal MP and ask them why they're raising your taxes, Mr. Speaker. I just, I implore my colleagues opposite to really have a think about this. And when you're in your caucus meetings, ask how these tax increases will affect your constituents and ask what that huge increase in deficit means not just for your constituents but their children and their children's children and hopefully uh, Mr. Speaker we can um, see something good come out of this.
Questions et commentaires, the Honorable Member, l'Honorable Député. Questions and comments, the Honorable Member for Gatineau. Et merci, uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I'd like to thank my Honorable colleague, colleague for her speech. You know, a one unemployed person in Canada is one employed person too many. Obviously, we are experiencing something in the energy sector today that Quebec went through with forestry, New Brunswick went through with in the mining sector and the manufacturing sector in Ontario and in Quebec as well over the past decade. Lost is one job too many. The, the member opposite watched as oil prices went from 110 to 90 to 70 to 50 dollars under the previous government, and yet we did not hear the kind of speech that she gave to this chamber today. The member opposite was the Minister of Western Economic Diversification, and my question is, what measures did she put in place in the last 10 years? That would, that would gird Alberta and our energy sector, which is living through a crisis, through the kind of situation that they're going through now? That's a good question. Before we go to the uh, honourable member, I want to remind the members in the House uh, and the, uh, the uh, member who's about to speak that they're speaking through the chair and not to the other side. Uh, the honourable member for Calgary Nose Hill. Well, Mr. Speaker, during my tenure as Minister of State for Western Economic Diversification, I completely remodeled the department on five key theme areas. Skilled labor training, Mr. Speaker, ensuring that there was a better pathway for commercialization of uh, research and development happening in Western Canada, including a $100 million fund uh, to see uh, process developments, prototypes uh, commercialized and put into markets. Uh, I worked with First Nations communities to ensure that First Nations and Aboriginal communities in Western Canada had equal access to economic opportunities created in Western Canada. I work to ensure that trade and investment opportunities with new markets were op opened up to Western Canadian trade groups and producers. And I also worked with the Western Canadian aerospace sector to ensure that small, medium-sized enterprise had access into our supply chain. But I also stood up for my constituents day in and day out and said that the argument around Canada's energy is not the energy sector is not a good versus evil debate, but that one that we should it's a sector that we should embrace race throughout the country because it creates jobs, and we also saw the lowest federal tax burden in over 50 years, which, incre which increased investment. I think that's a pretty good record and one that I'm more than happy to stand up on.